Hey. How you doing? How are you? I'm good to good. see you. Good. It's so good to see you. It's been so it's long. Been a long time. Yeah. How have you been? I'm pretty good. Good. I'm pretty good. good. Thank you for having me. I'm I'm invested in children okay. and in that population because I've been there for mm-hmm. so so long. Well, in the residents. Um, and I'm seeing like second generation of my families wow. now. So right. the multicultural curriculum program really started in about 91, 92 mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. as a pilot. And did it, did, um, what was the Rodney King? Wasn't that? I thought that was ninety. It was. It was two. provoked by that. Yeah, ninety two. Right? Ninety two. Mm-hmm. Yes. The Rodney King incident that was that people saw all over the world, really, uh, and children's meant that we started to talk again about what we called our own private Rodney Kings. The circumstances where families felt as if they were not being taken care of in a respectful way. That was a big part of our work, being certain that we were living up to the principles that mm-hmm. had clearly been established through the conversations already in the hospital, that given the composition of the faculty at Children's and given the composition of the patients we were taking care of, that the faculty could really not teach about the issues of culture and race and difference and income and the like. And so. We spent a lot of time working with community groups and and families to actually come in and teach. When I think of the two terms, cultural competency versus cultural humility, for me, cultural competency implies kind of a subject, a a topic, you know, and people do feel like I need to know this or not, and if I don't know this, I'm not smart or whatever. Whereas for me, cultural humility is a philosophy. It's an approach. It is a tool, you know, so it's not something to be I'm going to master it or not. It's it's my approach. It's how I will handle the situation. Last year, I was the coordinator of the student support team, which are the meetings that families have um, with teachers when their kids are having trouble. Um, and it was quite interesting to just try to navigate that those meetings in a way that worked with the, the principles of cultural humility. Um, just to really try to say to my colleagues, let's hear what this parent is experiencing and what this parent hears about from their child. And let's try to talk about, let's try to talk about that as a starting point rather than, you know, your kid is X, Y, Z. One of the things that helped me out a lot to be able to also kind of make peace with not knowing is that for a long time I mistook not knowing for lack of intelligence. And a dear friend of mine pointed out to me once when I was having a conversation about this, he said, it's not that you're not intelligent, is that you don't have, you know, your fund of knowledge in this particular area, you, you don't have it. So it doesn't take away from your intelligence by any stretch of the imagination. You just, you don't know because no one's told you or you haven't asked that question. And it allowed me to be able to ask a million questions because now I didn't feel like I was saying to the world or to the person or to the patient or to the community, I'm stupid. I was actually just saying, I just don't know. In the same way in the fund of knowledge with medicine, there's no way for you to know something unless you learn about it. Mm-hmm. But in no way, shape or form does it take away your intelligence. So once I could distinguish the difference, I was comfortable with not knowing anymore. The article gets written but not published right away about what we learned from all of this work, working with communities. And this is the cultural humility piece that people have now used in many venues, not just in medicine, but in education. Many uh, nonprofit organizations use the cultural uh, humility principles Mm -hmm. in their work. The principles are not just about individual activity and behavior. Institutions have got to be self-reflective. Lifelong learners have to really believe that the communities that are being Mm -hmm. served really do know what they want and what they need, right? And they're in the best position to let us know what that is. People living in poverty have the least access to power to change the structure of policies of poverty and are often denied effective solutions to combat the violations to their human rights. And I care about this issue because my brother is an innocent man with special needs who has been held in what I call modern day slavery for two years now for a crime that he did not commit. And I come to you because the so-called justice system is not designed to benefit my community. And I can hear the voice of the oppressor echoing, no, you don't deserve to have rights, just us. 
You don't have a history, just us. You don't have the strength to control your mind, just us. You don't remember what your fight is about, just us. There are these moments that grab everybody's attention that we can take advantage of, and I think the Rodney King more of the response to Rodney King is what inspired a lot of conversation and a lot of soul searching and a lot of people seeking ways that we could have these conversations in, in with better result and and then you know it fades officers facing felony criminal charges were among a group of 15 who stopped a 25-year-old black man last Saturday night, then beat him, kicked him, and clubbed him. At WHAT Radio, host Mary Mason fielded scores of calls from members of the black community, angered by the verdict, it is open war against black folks. shocked by the violence that followed. We need to love and respect one another. We need to stop in 2010, Arizona passed a law that authorized local police to check the immigration status of anyone of whom they suspect of being an illegal immigrant to the United States. And who has the right to call another human being illegal? Most of these illegals are the ones working in the fields, cleaning homes, landscaping, or jobs that have the right to pay lower than minimum wage. There are things that are difficult to hear, and there are things that are just plain hard to see. So, you know, how it is a fish doesn't see water. It's very hard when you benefit from great privilege to see it as that. And I would say it, it, it takes constant reminding. And I don't, I, I certainly don't see it all the time. And, and each time I'm reminded of it, I'm reminded that I'm reminded of it. That why do I have to be reminded of it? Oh, but I do. I heard the white woman behind us say, you foreigners have no manners. My initial reaction was anger and confusion. Anger because I felt discriminated against and judged. Confusion because she was an older woman so hadn't she been around long enough to know that she is not a native of this country either? We are constantly bombarded by subliminal messages that light skin is superior. Immigration policy is continuously debated in the White House while brown men are hoping to land a side job outside of Home Depot. How does cultural humility come to life at Berkeley Media Studies Group? I have to credit Tony Bourbon. Tony Bourbon, uh, may he rest in peace, was a violence prevention advocate par excellence who I met early in our years uh, in working on violence prevention when we first started um, the um, Berkeley Media Studies Group. And, um, and Tony just confronted me <laughs> and, uh, you know, and said, you live in California. How many of your staff speak Spanish? And I had to say, um, none. And, and Tony, in a, um, I was going to say loving, it wasn't in a loving way, it was in a confrontational way. I mean, we, we grew to love each other and each other's work and had great respect for each other, I think, um, as, as our relationship blossomed. But he had no, uh, he had no fear about saying what was important.